priest. There was never a time in my life that, that I didn't think about being a priest. From the time I was a little kid to high school, it was always at least in the back of my mind. And, and I just can't imagine my life not being a priest. It's, it's just been the greatest joy, the greatest blessing in my life. And, and it's nothing that I've done. It's, it was just the Lord's gracious call that He placed on my life, not because I was any better than anybody else, but for one reason or another, God invited me to be a priest. And it's just been the most amazing blessing in my life. Huh? And there have been occasions where I wanted to be able to say thank you. It's like, you ever been to that point where you, you've just been filled with such a deep gratitude that you want to thank somebody and, and, and you want to say thank you, but <laughs> thank you just doesn't seem enough. Is the Eucharist is this thanksgiving. It's a thanksgiving between the Son and the Father. It's Jesus' perfect thank you to the Father. And, and as a priest, and when I celebrate the Eucharist, I'm able to finally say thank you. And, and it's a thank you that's adequate. It's a thank you that's enough. And that's why the liturgy is such a blessing and a grace that, that, we be, that we're able to participate in that and, and come before the Lord. And, and I've been able to be able to celebrate Masses in, in some of the most amazing places in the world. I've, I've been able to celebrate Mass at St. Peter's in Rome and, and all of the major basilicas and, and, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem and some of the most beautiful, fantastic churches in the world and in some of the most humble settings. The, that it's a remarkable event that takes place that every time I celebrate Mass, Jesus is present. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, I take bread and I take wine, and God's presence comes upon that, and He makes Himself known. Huh? The bread and the wine is transformed into His body and His blood. For over 2,000 years, uh, Catholic Christians have come together <laughs> over 350,000 times every day. We come together and, and we take bread, and we take wine, and we pray. Uh, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would change and transform that bread and wine, and that bread and wine becomes the body and the blood of Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, becomes the body and the blood of Christ. Based on what we say in the Eucharist, the Eucharistic prayer, we invoke the Holy Spirit upon the elements before we say the words uh, uh, of Jesus. So I, I see that when we pray this, this prayer that Ecclesis, what we're praying is that we're praying the Holy Spirit to, uh, to bring forth what God wants us to, to do. And as Jesus says the words, the Holy Spirit makes happen the transformation, transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. So it, it's, it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the connection between the, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this moment that makes present bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. In the sixth chapter of John, Jesus invites us literally to eat his body and to drink his blood. And for Jesus' followers at the time, they heard that and they said, I mean, this is hard. This teaching is hard. He literally, the Greek says, unless you eat, unless you gnaw on my body and drink my blood. And they said, this is difficult. We'll no longer follow you. And it's interesting to look at that text, that Jesus doesn't come back and say, well, what I meant was, or, or don't take me so seriously, but he literally allowed his followers to leave, to no longer follow them. It just breaks my heart when sometimes somebody comes and they say to me, Father Dave, I just don't get anything out of Mass. And, and I ask myself, how can that be that, that we take bread and we take wine and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' body and blood is present and, and we can say, I just don't get anything out of that. And, and, that, and that says something more about me. It, it says more about me than it says about the priest or about the music. But, but not that those things aren't important, but every time we come to celebrate the Mass by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' body and blood is present to us, huh? So that when we say that, that we don't get something out of it, something has to change in me, huh? Something has to change in us. And that's why I think it's important to go and look at and see what Jesus said. When people said to him, this teaching is hard, what did Jesus say? He says, it is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is to no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So when the people come to Jesus and they say, oh, this teaching is hard, Jesus says it's the Spirit that gives life, that, that in itself it, it doesn't make sense. If, if we're just resting and, and counting on our own flesh to make sense of this unbelievable reality, it's not going to make sense to us. But it's the Spirit that gives life. Huh? St. John Paul goes and he speaks to that as well. He says, uh, at the center of the church is the Eucharist, where Christ is present and active in humanity and in the whole world by the means of the Holy Spirit. That, 
that left to ourself and just me trying to make sense out of this, it doesn't make sense. That we can take bread and wine and it becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that doesn't make any sense. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to transform the bread and the wine into the body and blood and it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to illuminate my mind and my heart that I understand. One of the common things that people say is that when they experience the Holy Spirit more profoundly in their life, they also come to a greater realization of Christ's presence in the Mass. Uh, why is that? Because it's the Holy Spirit that makes Christ present in the Mass and it's the Holy Spirit that comes upon me, that comes upon you, that allows us to see that. Huh? The Spirit gives life. I've always, always believed in the true presence. That, that was never a stumbling block for me. But I've struggled with the actualization of it. Like, I'm, I'm ingesting the God of the universe. Like, what does this mean? What, what are the implications of that? And really, it was probably around a month after I made my first retreat where I decided to give my life to the Lord and I decided to live a life in the Spirit, that when I received the Eucharist and I went back to my, I went back to my pew and I was kneeling, I started crying and felt like, Lord, this is what you've made me for, to commune with you and to be fully alive in you. But it wasn't until I had the Spirit that I was able to understand that. In the Catechism it says, uh... At the heart of the Eucharistic celebration are bread and wine that, by the words of Christ and the invocation of the Holy Spirit, becomes Christ's body and blood. What he did on the eve of his passion, he took bread, he took the cup, which had been filled with wine. So the Catechism reminds us that, that the Eucharist simply isn't possible without the Holy Spirit. The Eucharist is saturated by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when, when we come before the Lord, we, we have to ask that the Holy Spirit would bless us so as to be able to experience the great richness and the beauty and Christ's present himself in, in this Eucharist. So we want to reflect just a little bit on how the Holy Spirit is present and how the Holy Spirit is active in Mass and, and how the Holy Spirit is active in us. huh? And, and maybe even begin first by before we even actually get to Mass, the, that point that we say, ah, am I going to go to Mass today? You know. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that I have any desire, that you have any desire to go to Mass. And, and I know that there are times that are difficult, that, that life gets busy and crazy. And it's like, oh, I don't even know if we should go to Mass. There's so much going on. Or, or you've got kids that you have to get ready. I remember my mom, she would often say, you know, there were six little kids under the age of eight and getting us all ready to go to Mass drove mom and dad crazy, huh? And she said, she goes, you know, getting ready for Mass is not supposed to be a near occasion of sin, huh? But, but it's the Holy Spirit that, that, that moves in our hearts. So if, if there's even not this desire to go to Mass, then just stop and say, Lord, just give me a greater desire to go to liturgy. Give me a greater desire to go to Mass. That, that the Holy Spirit begins to work in us even before we come to the church. You know, pray as you're going to Mass. Lord, uh, open my heart and my mind as, so as to be able to receive all that you have for me in this liturgy. So the Holy Spirit is active in our hearts and our lives even before we get to the church. But one of the, the places I like to reflect on, on the presence of the Holy Spirit, is actually the penitential act. We've just arrived to Mass, we're still getting settled, still getting the kids settled, and, and paying attention on who's here and who's not here, what color is Father wearing today, okay? And we're just kind of getting that all in, and, and we find ourselves in the middle of the penitential act. And yet, I think it's one of the most beautiful parts of the Mass. And, and it's really a part of the Mass where we call upon the Holy Spirit, that, that at this point that we're going before the Lord and, and we're asking the Lord to forgive us of our sins. The liturgy is ordered towards the forgiveness of sin, with the exception of mortal sin. The, the, every time we come to Mass, the Lord wants to forgive all of our sins. But oftentimes at that part, we're thinking about something else. Did I leave the, did I leave the water on at the house? Or, and we just need to be able to stop and say, come Holy Spirit. The grace that there is at the penitential act, to, to be able to recognize our sin, so as to be able to get, get rid of that so that we can enter into the rest of the liturgy, huh? so that we pray at the penitential act, uh, come Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to me so that I can know my sin, so that I can get rid of that sin, so that I can enter into the rest of the liturgy. The scriptures came alive. Like I, I remember reading my Bible after and I was like, oh my gosh, that's for me. And the, and the, the scriptures like shot out at me and words started to impact my heart and I'll go to Mass in the Eucharist. I'll, I literally remember my first time going to Mass after and I was just like, <laughs> you know, I, my jaw dropped. I was like, this is God. You know, there's this conviction that came into my heart that was, in, was insane. It, it, was, it was amazing. And, 
it really brought me closer to Jesus in the Eucharist. The, the next place to look at is, is the scriptures, huh? when the Word of God is proclaimed. I had a wonderful opportunity to go to Africa and it was just, it was just fantastic and beautiful celebrating Mass with them and, and their local custom and tradition that was just, it was just a great, great experience and being able to celebrate Mass there. But one of the coolest things happened is, was at the proclamation of the gospel. So we had done the readings, we'd done the psalm response, and we were doing the Alleluia. And literally from the back of the field, uh, the deacon came and he began pro, uh, processing with the word. And, and he was holding up the book of the gospels like we do at Mass on Sundays. But, but theirs was a celebration. And the people started cheering and clapping. And, and there was a procession with the deacon. And there were several people and altar servers and candles and incense. And it was the welcoming, uh, welcoming in of the word, welcoming in the word of God. And, and, and there was dancing. It, it reminded me perhaps what it looked like when David danced in front of the ark. It was, it was just the greatest, most famous person was arriving. And there was, there was celebration and rejoicing and singing. And it was just... It was phenomenal and I watched this event and I thought to myself, okay, this is different than what I've experienced, that, that they, they recognize something here that I think I've missed. And yes, of course, I know that the Word of God is the Word of God, but the way they celebrated the Word of God, it was, it was stunning. And I think it changed the way that, that I approach the scriptures when, when, when I proclaim the Word of God at Mass. That, that the Word of God is active and it's alive. The Holy Spirit has blessed that Word. It's not just the words from any other book, but, but it's a Word that by the power of the Holy Spirit can change your life and can change my life. I, I remember one occasion I had, it was outside Washington, D.C., and, and I was preaching about the power of the Word and how the Holy Spirit wants to bless the Word so that that Word blesses us, huh? So that the Word moves in us. And this elderly lady comes up to me afterwards and she says, Father Dave, can I tell you about a time my life changed coming to Mass through the scriptures? I said, yes, you can tell me. Of course I would want to hear that. And, and she says, well, it was the fourth chapter of John. I was standing there and I had heard that reading before and it was Jesus talking about giving this water so that we'd never thirst again. She goes, I've heard that since I was a little girl. But she said, this time I heard that scripture and I said, Jesus, I want that water. In the middle of Mass, I just said, I want that water. She said, Father Dave, I felt the presence of God flood my heart in a way that I had never experienced in my life. She said, that water just filled me. And she said, at that moment, I was satisfied. Huh? She goes, I have never come to Mass the same. Every time I come into the Mass, I pay more attention when the scriptures are, are, are proclaimed because I understand that that moment can change my life that can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that, that every time as the word is being proclaimed, just take a moment, just take one second and say, Jesus, what do you want to say to me through this scripture? What is it that you want to say, speak to me, reveal to me through the scriptures, through the readings today? And by the power of the Holy Spirit, open my mind and my heart that I can receive that. That's the grace of the Holy Spirit. I didn't really, I didn't really read. Do you remember, I don't know if you remember, but do you remember the first time you really read the Bible? Like, I've read scripture, but the first time where God's words came to life, and to me, that's the Holy Spirit. I really believe that the Holy Spirit, um, you know, who leads us into all truth, He was bringing me into the truth of the Eucharist. And that was like, oh my gosh, this is really Jesus, you know? So that next couple months, so I was receiving the Eucharist, like, I was, I was in shock, you know? Because a lot of things Jesus did shocked people. Like, it, you know, it, it, was, it was scandalous, and I experienced that scandal of grace, which was like the flesh of Jesus in my body every day if I wanted to, you know? And the Holy Spirit is continually drawing me deeper into that reality. Maybe just for a second, huh? After the readings are proclaimed, the priest is about to preach, and, and even that, that can actually even be a moment of grace, believe it or not, huh? So what I would ask you to do is pray for the priest. I mean, it's not easy preaching to a congregation that is so diverse. I mean, just think of the people around you every Sunday at Mass and preaching something that, that stirs in the hearts of all of the people is, is really difficult. So pray for the priest, not just that his homily be short, but also pray that, that your heart and your mind would be open to the words that he has. I think sometimes that the attitude of people when they come to Mass is, well, if I'm going to get anything out of the Mass, it depends on if Father gives a good homily or if the music is good. But 
you bear some of the responsibility that, that you go before the Lord and you say, Lord, open up my heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, open my mind so that I can receive all that you have for me in the Eucharist. It's not just the priest's job or the music minister's job, huh? but it's all of our job. We come together as a community to be able to celebrate. It's interesting, I, I, when I first received the Eucharist at, at the Easter Vigil, I entered the church, I was, was expecting something that didn't happen. And it, it caused me to, to, as joyous as that occasion was, it caused me to begin to reevaluate what, what the Eucharist was. And I remember distinctly three weeks later, uh, after I'd gone back and reread all the catechism and, <laughs> and all the teachings, what, what am I missing? And, and where I was sitting in the church, a Eucharistic minister kept booming the body of Christ, the body of Christ. And as he kept repeating that, it was as if uh, somebody was pounding a nail in and I was understanding God's love for me and God's love for all people and that he wanted me to, sh to, to share that love. And, and um, the, I, I began to understand this nourishment um, that my spirit was being nourished uh, and it, it, was, it was transforming. And it was at that point I started going to daily mass because th there was nothing, nothing that could satisfy like receiving that Eucharist. And, um, I, and it, uh, what, what I loved about daily mass was it was peaceful and quiet and I was able to linger in prayer and, and uh, just, just allow the, the Lord to, to really minister to me. Another, I think, really, really beautiful part of the Mass, and, and, and I think can be a really moving part of the Mass that we often overlook, is the simple offertory. And again, I remember being in Africa during the offertory. It's, it, they, of course, they bring up the bread and the wine, but it wasn't just the bread and the wine. A woman comes up with a blanket that she had made, and she offers that to the church, just a, a symbol of, of her gift to the church. Of, and they bring up wheat and, and corn and grains, and in all of this, so it's, it's, it's something that's being offered from the community, but it wasn't even just that. I mean, at this one point, this, this woman comes up and she gives me a chicken, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure everybody was laughing because I'm sitting there, I don't know what to do, and they give me this chicken, and he's gobbling whatever chickens do, huh? And, and, and I've got this chicken in my hand, I'm just kind of looking, and, and I give the chicken to the server because I didn't know what else to do. But, but then the next thing, the coolest thing, they, they literally came up with a baby, and, and they, they offer me a baby. It's like, this is fantastic. I've always wanted to have a baby. But, but, but what became very apparent to me is it wasn't just bread and wine it was being offered. It was everything was being offered. And that's, that's obviously what we do every liturgy at the offering. It's not just bread and wine, but, but everything is being placed on the altar. That the, the priest takes in the, the prayers of the people. He takes in the dreams and the hopes and the difficulties and the sufferings and the crosses and everything is placed on the altar, not just the bread and the wine. And it's not just the bread and the wine that's transformed, huh? B but our brokenness is placed on the altar and the Lord makes it whole. Uh, our fear is placed on the altar and the Lord gives us courage. Our despair and the Lord gives us hope. It's, it's everything is placed on that altar. So the next time when you come to Mass, it's not just the bread and the wine that's placed on the altar, but, but place your very self there and watch what the power of the Holy Spirit can do, huh? And then there's obviously at the, the obvious time, huh? The consecration, when the priest takes the bread and the wine and, and he places his hand over, over the bread and wine, and, and that prayer is called the Epiclesis. And, and the canon says, and we hear this every time when we come to Mass, in the second canon it says, Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or in the third Eucharistic prayer, it says, By the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things, and by the same spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration. That, that at that point, the Holy Spirit is, is ever present. It's not like he just shows up at that moment. The Holy Spirit has been ever present in this Eucharist. That at that time when the priest uh, places his hands over the bread and the wine, uh, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
who becomes the body and blood of Jesus. And another neat thing uh, that happens that honestly probably most people aren't even aware of is that when the priest is celebrating the Mass, particularly at the time of the consecration, the rubric invites him to lean over and to breathe on the bread and the wine. Uh, that, that should remind us of the 20th chapter of John when Jesus breathes upon the, the apostles and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. The priest breathes on that and gives life to it. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he breathes life into this bread and wine, that it's no longer the bread and the wine, but it's the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus that, that walked the earth, the same Jesus that raised Lazarus from the dead, that gave sight to the blind man, uh, that healed the cripple, is present in this altar. Uh, that, that we go before the Lord and we ask that the Holy Spirit would, would reveal to us and to move in our heart and in our minds so that we can believe, so that we can see, so that we can know, so that we can experience. And maybe finally, that, that at the end of the liturgy, that, that when we are sent forth, it's not just that we're sent forth on our own, but we're sent forth in the power of the Holy Spirit, that, that when we go out, that there's a world that desperately needs to know what we've just heard, huh? So that, that when we receive the, the Eucharist and the celebration of the Eucharist and the power of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that it's not just this little thing for us who happen to be at church that day, but it's supposed to impact the world. So, so that we go forth and, and we participate in works of ministry and, and we feed the poor and, and we help those that are less fortunate than ourselves. That tragic that we walk out of Mass and we ignore people around us that, that, that need the grace of God, that need His love, that need His presence, that need His help. That, that it's our job to be able to do that so that the Eucharist is supposed to help spur that. Huh? The Eucharist is supposed to help us recognize the body of Christ and, and to be able to help transform that body, which desperately needs to hear what you've heard and to see what you've seen. Huh? Every time we come to the Eucharist, that, that we experience the power and the presence of God. And that when we receive this Eucharist, it, it literally nourishes us for the rest of the spiritual life. It gives us the strength. It's, it, it gives us what's necessary so as to be able to go and, and to be able to love and to be patient, to be kind and to be generous and all that. All of this huh, we experience every time we come to the Eucharist. Every time that I was listening to the Eucharistic prayer, it became a charismatic experience. I was realizing who I was receiving and what I was being called to do and uh, to, to be able to go out and truly proclaim. And I, I, I love that, uh, the, the fact that the word mass comes from the word missa, mission, and, and that we are being called forward to be other Christs out in the world. And, uh, and, and we, so when we receive that Eucharist, that, that, is, that gives us what we need to be able to go forth. So here's my encouragement for you. Maybe, Maybe take a few moments and, and take a look at the sixth chapter of John. Again, that's the, the text. It's called the Bread of Life Discourse. And, and it's Jesus speaking about uh, his presence, his body, and his blood, but also how the Spirit helps us come to understand that. So take a couple of minutes. Just be quiet and still and pray through that. You know, for, for some people, your prayer may be, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That, that you want to believe, but it's just, it's just so hard. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And, and by your Holy Spirit, help me to really believe. Uh, the next time you go to Mass, spend a few minutes before you go to Mass and say, Jesus, just open my eyes and my heart and to be able to see all the ways that you are present, all the ways that your Holy Spirit is active in this Eucharist. Uh, help me to be able to see that. So why don't we pray? Jesus, come with your Holy Spirit. Lord, you have given us the gift of the Eucharist, of which we are unbelievably grateful and, and we come before you and we say thank you. And, and we understand that when we celebrate the Eucharist, it is a perfect eternal thanksgiving. So we thank you for the Eucharist, the gift that is in the Eucharist. Jesus, open our mind and our heart that we're able to see you and experience you every time we come to the Eucharist. Jesus, take away any, anything that hinders us from being able to experience and, and know you and encounter you in the Eucharist. May your Holy Spirit, which is alive in the Eucharist, be alive in me so that I might experience your, your love and your presence more profoundly, that I might encounter you more richly, huh? more powerfully every time I come to the Eucharist. Come Holy Spirit, bring to life in me your grace, bring to life in me the power of the Eucharist. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Oh, speak.